Hello, uh, thanks for joining us. I'm Dan Sullivan. I'm one of the programmers at Film at Lincoln Center and a member of the selection committee for this, the 2020 edition of New Directors New Films, our annual uh, co-presentation uh, with the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, as you're doubtlessly all aware, uh, we're, we've postpo we had postponed uh, New Directors this year. It ordinarily uh, takes place in the second half of March, um, but we're, we're really, um, pleased to, uh, to, to finally be able to, um, to unveil uh, these films uh, to, our, to our audience uh, before the year is through. So, um, so I, I think first and foremost, I wanna thank all the, uh, all the filmmakers for bearing with us in uh, what has been uh, a really you know, uncomfortable year for, for everyone. But, um, but, uh, but in this context, I, I wanna uh, give a shout out to all the artists who uh, kind of got hosed by all this, but um, but hopefully uh, hopefully things will change soon. And uh, yeah, I for um, for this particular session, I want to thank the distributor uh, of of the film you just watched, and at thirteen thousand feet. Uh, so thank you to Cinema Guild. And uh, finally, uh, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, my my guest. Uh, my guest right now, uh, Kazakh Vrodvonsky, the uh, the director of. And at thirteen thousand feet, hello, Kazakh. Hi. Yeah, happy to be here, or be here virtually. Yeah, sad to not be in New York uh, yeah. this year in person, but uh, so happy. Uh, very happy to be a part of this program uh, at the Lincoln Center in, in MoMA. Yeah. Yeah. New directors, new films. Uh, screened my my first feature uh, back in two thousand twelve, and that was a really great experience. So it means a lot yeah. to be back in the uh, in the program. No, we're we're very happy to uh, to have you back, and um, maybe we could we could just begin. I mean, you kind of pointed in this direction um, already, but um, but you know, uh, to say nothing of like the way that this the festival is postponed and so on. Um, this is just uh, and at thirteen thousand feet is just a film that you've been uh, living with, uh, working on for uh, quite a long time. Um, so maybe we could. Uh, we should begin by just backing up and talking a little bit about the uh, the whole history of the project. Um, uh, I think it, it was it was something like two year two some years in the works. Um, uh, could you just yeah. tell us a yeah? Could you tell us a little bit about what the kind of point of departure was, and then um, and then sure maybe, yeah. I mean yeah, we could bring it back even further because uh, I mean talking about. New York, uh, Dara for years in New York. So in a lot of ways, this project started when she moved back to Toronto. And uh, I was familiar with her work or I'd seen her in, in films uh, by uh, Matt Porterfield and, and Nathan Silver. So I was excited to see her join the, the uh, Toronto community and, um, you know, start dreaming up a project with her. So that's really was like the, uh, the, when the seed was planted, she has a, a brief cameo in my, uh, my movie, How Heavy This Hammer, uh, but that was almost, you know, a test run for this film. Uh, but yeah, I wrote a screenplay uh, and I showed that um, to Dara, I would say like two, it's hard to think back now, um, but I showed her the screenplay and, um, we just kept working on it. Um, we had a few false starts or we would try things and then wanna sort of backpedal and find a different entry point into the film. But yeah, we, 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 we found at times we were, we were overthinking the project and um, it really started to, to work when the characters started to come to life or Dara could live with the character for a bit and we could film with the character for a bit. Uh, one of the things Dara did is she, uh, volunteered at the daycare and worked at the actual daycare where it's uh, set you know little things like that really helped us um figure that because i think we were we were afraid of of uh limiting the character or having it to it, it just felt very false anytime it felt too prescriptive or too pre-planned that we really wanted to be careful so a very long process you know, i think we were shooting this film on and off for about two years you'd you'd mentioned uh Tower, uh, which uh, which was in uh, New Directors, of course, um, and it uh, made me curious uh, about the relationship uh, between Anne at thirteen thousand feet 
and uh, your previous your previous films, um, you know, I think there's like a there's a lot, there are a lot of like stylistic continuities, of course, but in other ways, the film is something of a departure. Uh, uh, in terms of process, I think, and like female protagonist, the female protagonist, um, but it's also like quite different from uh, the last film that I think the like our audience uh, uh, saw of yours, uh, Scaffolding, the the short film, which. Um, uh, could maybe be characterized as a more sort of like formalist kind of uh, kind of work. I don't know. I'm not sure. Perhaps you disagree. But um, yeah, could you just tell us a bit about the relationship between the new film and uh, and the films that preceded it? Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, they're all um, somewhat reactions to each other. Uh, so yeah, even mentioning Scaffold or, or Cutaway are sort of almost like palate cleansers for me to do something a bit more formally minded or uh, something on uh, on on sticks and not handheld uh and you know wide shots so that yeah the majority of my work my early short films and my last two features are are handheld and um very much uh uh you know fascinated with the protagonist so i was suppo i suppose the biggest difference between those films and, and at thirteen thousand feet is that is the collaboration again with dara um in the previous films i normally don't show the script to the actors and I'm constantly rewriting the script, rewriting it um, based on, you know, learning how the actors speak because they have, they bring more of, you know, documentary like qualities to the film and um, the sort of nuances of how they actually talk and their mannerisms. I, I like to slowly tailor into the film with Dara. Dara has a, a writing credit on this film because we had just so many conversations and, uh, you know, her insight was so valuable too and sort of, building this character with me, that it was much, a, a very different collaboration uh, for me, just the, uh, cause yeah, Dara of course is a filmmaker in her own, own right as well. And um, so it, it we, I had to relearn a lot of things and a lot of my, uh, my usual tactics had to be rethought. And, um, but yeah, and a lot of patience uh, on Dara's part too, as we sort of slowly figure this out. But I think, yeah, uh, it was really motivated by her moving back to Toronto. And we just really liked the idea of collaborating with each other and the uh, excitement that brought to the project. Yeah, um, uh, you mentioned you mentioned Dara's own, um, own filmmaking. And uh, yeah, I, uh, the film that she co-directed with uh, Sofia Bodanovic, uh, MS Slavic 7 was actually in New Directors, uh, just was that last yeah, I believe last just year. last year. Yeah, um, and uh, and yeah. So um, so uh, maybe we can um, we can dig into uh, that collaboration um, a little more. Um, kind of you know like how it, how it proceeds because um, uh, the film is like uh, so much about uh, her performance, her incarnation of the of the character, and so on. And given that she has a co-writing credit, one would imagine that she, um, yeah, that she had like a big say in like a lot of the things that were ha that happened in the film. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's just kind of how did how did uh, that collaboration sort of proceed? And um, yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of times it was it was sort of simple in the sense that I, you know, would sometimes think I had a great scene. Uh, written or planned out and then it would just fall flat or would not feel right and if it didn't feel right to Dara or it felt off in any way yeah I would just pivot and and go to a different scene and then other times it would be something you know a scene that seemed kind of banal or lower lower key and then it would just explode so I would follow uh, those um, those leads whenever they happen that a lot of trust in in, in in just sort of what worked and what didn't and sort of really gauging um, yeah, how, how, how things felt with the character. And then other things too, that we, uh, we incorporated a lot of sort of um, things from my own life, my, my mom's in the film, but then uh, also uh, one of Dara's best friends plays, plays Sarah, Dorothea. So yeah, we tried to sort of, it's a real mixture of sort of real things and fake things. And, um, and but a lot of it is just trying to craft the right sort of atmosphere and tone for the character, or at least initially. Um, because we were sort of in some ways creating it from nothing um, compared to what I was used to doing. Yeah, yeah and did you, um, yeah, I'm, curi I'm curious whether uh, the two of you um, uh, sort of like, like whether you discussed the, the characters, um, 
psychology a lot because uh, that might seem like an obvious question, but I, um, I think in some of your other work, um, you display this kind of like uh, this attunedness to like um, surf, you know, surfaces of things, and um, it's 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 not. I, I feel like it's not always so much about um, psychology, and maybe it's not even here. But I just think uh, I'm just curious whether for her is like the performer and just yeah. you know in your collaborator, um, sort of what value she put in that, uh, and what kind of work the two of you did on that. We did, yeah. We had a lot of time to research, so we had a lot of conversations about, uh, you know, personal history, uh, backstory, various diagnoses, um, and that was a, a blessing and a curse. So I suppose when I'm talking about finding our footing in the film, a lot of it was sort of stripping our way uh, ourselves away from some of that research. That I think overall we're happy that we did it, but it's. Um, you know, as we started to work on the film and as it started to, it, it, you know, some of this research ended up was limiting the film. And um, something that gave me a lot of insight was when we started screening the film to various doctors and medical professionals. What was really insightful is that their reaction was that they found the film more useful without too much context. That the, what, what they liked was the lack of, of prescription that if we pinpoint what it is, then it becomes less useful, um, that it's less true to, true to life, that when you encounter people, you don't know their whole history. You don't know what medication they're on. You don't know if they've had you know, previous trauma. Um, and the more we had those conversations, that, it, that felt like where I was comfortable as a filmmaker was inha inhabiting that sort of territory of, of not knowing precisely what the diagnosis is and that there isn't necessarily an easy um, solution to, you know, you can't just solve someone's life, that it's a, uh, you know, a, an ongoing, um, yeah, uh, an ongoing ordeal or ongoing uh, experience uh, to so, so slowly sort of get to understanding. Yeah. Um, there are also, you know, there are not, I mean, in part because of the, uh, because of Anne's uh, job in the film, there are a lot of uh, uh, child performers, you know, child actors and so on, <laughs> or not child performers, let's say. I, I'm not sure how many of them are like, uh, uh, union actors or what have you but um uh but uh could, yeah I mean could you just tell us a bit about like uh about working with kids in this context sure. yeah so again um it's a large daycare that we shot at my, my mom runs the daycare I went to that daycare uh, as a child uh so that was actually one of the inspirations for the film too was returning there as an adult and some of the teachers still work there was really sort of interesting uh, to sort of thinking about these people looked after me as a child that are now adults and just sort of um, or I, I'm an adult now and they're also adults and but I used anyways it, it it was uh it got a lot of ideas going so we really wanted to shoot at that daycare and I specifically wanted to just because I, I have all the these memories of, of of the daycare um but we worked with uh children in a, in a number of different ways uh so we would have you know entire classrooms sign permission forms sometimes and Dara would just walk into the classroom as a teacher that she'd volunteered there for a few weeks as a teacher. So we just, like a documentary, would film her on location and get very sort of organic things. Uh, the opening scene with the butterfly is a good example of that. But then there were maybe a dozen to half a dozen children that we worked with a lot more closely and almost sort of created like an acting camp where every Saturday we would workshop scenes with them. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, improvisation and we were very loose, but at the same time, it was very specific. And, you know, certain scenes, um, especially towards the end of the film, we shot over a number of weekends. And some, sometimes these sessions would just be, you know, multiple takes of one moment that we needed to sort of piece together. So a whole mixture of, 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 different, um, uh, of different approaches. And also, yeah, all the children brought different things. So for instance, Oliver, uh, the boy who talks about sharks, um, He's responsible for that dialogue. He is, uh, he brought his shark expertise to the film. So uh, that was all sort of inspired by uh, his uh, passion for sharks in real life. The, uh, the shark consultant on the, the shark uh, consultant on set. Yeah, you should have received another credit for that. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, one of the like, um, one of the key relationships w one would assume for kind of um, being that like responsive to you know, um, to 
uh, where you're filming and, and these, uh, the kind of spontaneity of these performances and so on, I would imagine is just the, uh, the collaboration with your cinematographer, Nikolai Mikhailov. Um, uh, could you just, uh, yeah, it's, how does that, um, how do the two of you kind of like uh, uh, work together on set when it's so much about, you know, kind of catching perhaps fleeting impressions uh, and so on? Yeah, um, Nikolai really brings a lot because in a lot of these scenarios, um, you know, when we're shooting in a live daycare, he can't really light the film um, as he would like to, that there's so many sort of limitations, but he's very good at, you know, uh, doing little tweaks here and there, um, hanging, you know, uh, diffusion from the ceilings. And he's a very resourceful cinematographer. And then beyond that, just his, uh, you know, uh, control of the camera that uh, we don't have uh, a focus puller. He's pulling the focus on all the shots. So his relationship with Dara, I think, evolved throughout the film too. And, you know, I think the amount of time um, that we spent shooting the film really helped Nikolai, uh, you know, and Dara uh, learn how to work with each other. And I think there was a real trust uh, between the two of them, um, just in terms of yeah, finding the right moments. And, um, you know, I always like to get to the point with a character where we don't, we have to talk about the character less and less that it's, we both instinctually kind of understand it. And I feel like that's true about Nikolai too, that he sort of learns the rhythms of her performance and knows how to follow the moment and when to, when to uh, adjust. Um, so yeah, Nikolai, Nikolai is huge. And yeah, he's, he, um, you know, shot my last feature too. And we've been, we're a very tight knit crew. There's maybe five or six of us that are sort of the key sort of collaborators and um, I hope I get to keep working with them all because we're, we'd, I'd lose a lot if I had to start fresh with someone that so much of it is sort of ingrained slowly over time and through all these shoots. Yeah, um, and one scenario in which, yeah, I would, I would assume he had to make some adjustments is of course in uh, filming skydiving, uh, yeah. which, which I think um, our audience will want to hear about. Could you just like, maybe you could just walk us through a little bit of that yeah, no, pretty... Nikolai in particular, because yeah, Nikolai's scared of heights. And, um, you know, these quite a, we shot in a, a few different planes. One of the planes was quite larger, but one of them, you know, was tiny, almost like a like a compact car. And Dara would jump out of the plane and Nikolai would still be in there, sort of having to fly back down the whole time. He's sort of petrified. Um, but yeah, that, you know, was difficult to shoot in a number of ways. We tried a lot of different camera setups, um, you know, got skydivers to mount sort of cameras on their helmets and things like that. But uh, so we, we filmed, the first thing we actually shot uh, was Dara jumping out of the plane. And to bring it back to MS Slavic 7, I think that was also the same day that Dara wrapped shooting on MS Slavic 7. And then in the afternoon, she, she jumped out of the plane. Um, <laughs> And we filmed that and there are moments of that jump in the film, but when Nikolai and I looked at the footage, it didn't look quite right. So um, we decided that I would jump out of the plane and we would do a camera test on me. We tried three or four different camera setups and I jumped out, I've never jumped out of a plane before. And um, then I showed that footage to Dara and she agreed to jump out of the plane again. And then we got the, the coverage right that time. So yeah, a lot of trial and error um, and a lot of, it was also great working with all the different uh, skydivers that uh, GoPros and cameras are such a part of skydiving. So yeah. they actually provided a lot of insight or gave us a lot of tricks that it really seemed like a perfect uh, pairing, um, filmmaking and skydiving. That it, uh, as tricky as it was, it was also um, a great experience too. Yeah, yeah. Um, the an experience I can't imagine many uh, many filmmakers get to <laughs> get to have in the context of making a movie. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, also, I mean, people will uh, will probably recognize uh, the the filmmaker Matt Johnson, who's uh, who's in the film uh, as uh, as Anne's uh, kind of love interest. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, could you? Um, yeah, could you just? Tell us about how um, how Matt came to be involved in in the in the film and sort of how maybe how because he's also a filmmaker it feels like there are a lot of filmmakers uh, sort of collaborating with other filmmakers to obtain these performances so maybe you could just uh, talk about how that kind of proceeded. Yeah, no, it's interesting that uh, yeah my my preference seems to be working with non actors or other filmmakers in terms of. Uh, 
Uh, it, I would suppose, I suppose a rule of thumb with, with my process is avoiding the acting unions too. But yeah, no, Matt's, uh, you know, both Matt and Dara um, bring so much to the projects. And I think part of it is because of, um, they are both filmmakers and they have, um, you know, that sort of invested interest in, in the film that, that investive, you know, they, they really get it that, uh, and it's, this is a film shot over a long period of time. So that trust, uh, and friendship, you know, really, you know, is 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 a huge asset on the film. But um, yeah, I met Matt when our films were screening. When yeah, Tower and the Dirties were on the uh, the festival circuit, and uh, Matt also has a cameo in Hammer as well. Uh, so yeah, somewhat similar to Dara. But yeah, I, and Matt and I are just you know good friends, and I think um, we uh, it just really sort of connect. And he just brings so much um, when he's on set just his instincts uh, for performance, which obviously come from, you know, his movies and his TV series that he is a, um, uh, it's hard to, hard to classify what Matt is, but yeah, he's so good at working in real locations, so good at adapting and doing it with so much creative energy that you really, you know, if you put Matt in a scene, it, uh, you'll get a lot to work with he'll put a, a lot into it so I think Dara and Matt at first were a little unsure about what that collaboration would be like but they quickly connected and um, I'm writing uh, you know my next project I'm writing it for the two of them again that uh, I'm hoping to keep working with those two. Right on um, and uh, I have um, I have a question about it's it's kind of like a variation on like the, uh, the question of influences or reference or, or so on but I've always known, like I've, uh, I know, I've known you to be a, a, a cinephile, a, a Dara as well. Um, uh, so, um, uh, but in, I think in this context, uh, one thing I, I, I was, I was sort of curious about more so than like um, cinematic kind of references, influences, and so on. Was I was curious um, whether the two of you kind of drew from other from other arts, uh, from the other arts uh, at all, and kind of some of your conversations about how the, the film would like look and feel, because you can almost uh, imagine they're, you know, you guys kind of drawing on like theatrical resources, music, you know, uh, literary resources and so on, almost as much as, uh, as film ones. Um, so, you know, uh, did you have like, did you have these other kind of like non you know, non non cinematic artworks uh, on your mind at all, or or yeah, yeah. I would say if if there was something outside of cinema, it probably would be literature. Um, yeah, Dara has a literature degree, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I think that that came up a few times talking about different um, different uh, books, uh, especially with her new project. And just that I'd mentioned it, that is actually playing a pretty big influence on it. But yeah, I sometimes, you know, with my own approach or just how we view a character, I'll, I'll think of books that I've read. Um, strangely, this one, now, Portrait of a Lady, or just, you know, the use of ellipses and sort of different perspectives of a character, or sort of a fragmented portrait of someone is something a little bit on my mind. Um, but yeah, if I'm being honest, likely the, the main influences are, are cinematic, um, or at least that really is the well that I'm, I think I can't help but draw from um, whenever yeah. I'm making a film. I think it's just buried in me. Yeah, and when you were drawing from the well, like uh, what, what, films, what films were like coming out of the well? Like what, what was on your mind? It's so funny with this film too, that you know, you know, it's being a cinephile, but it's like uh, a cinephile at different ages. And I think with this film, I went back to some of my really sort of earlier inspirations um so yeah i, I mean cassavetes but has always been been huge but uh even like talking about the skydiving scene you know when you do a skydiving scene you can't help but think of uh like leos cracks and, and sort of bad blood or even harmony Crean um and uh, mr lonely so i think we were I, I was thinking of scenes like that too um yeah uh cassavetes for sure especially coverage in some of the scenes in the uh, the meeting scene. I remember looking at footage from husbands and how they sort of covered that scene of all the characters sort of singing in the bar. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's funny when I talk about Cassavetes or, you know, casting my mother in the film. Um, but yeah, and then you're, I'm influenced by the, the sort of reverberations of that too. So yeah, Nathan Silver is a, um, you know, producer on this film. So of course I think of him casting his mother and all of his work too. So it's, you know, it's, it's influences, you know, refracted through different contexts and, you know, different ages. Um, but yeah, 
if if you spot an influence, it's probably there. There's a butterfly scene. So in the butterfly scene, I'm thinking of Burden of Dreams, um, the butterfly landing on uh, Kinski. Like there's all these little, and it's, you know, some are influences that, you know, the core ideology of the film and then others are sort of very momentary sort of small references. Um, but yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I, yeah, we definitely talk about films a lot as we shoot and uh, and a little bit about books. But yeah, music and art is something interesting to consider. But yeah, I can't immediately think of too many examples. Uh, but it's a good question. Yeah. Um, and uh, this will be this will be my last one. Um, uh, I guess I want to ask you about the uh, the editing because uh, I think when considering how long um, how long the film was in the works, um, uh, how much material one can imagine you like ending up with by the end, by the end of the, the shooting process. Um, but then the film itself is like a very, it's a very like uh, tight, like concise, it doesn't, they're, they're like no wasted frames. Um, uh, like how do you, yeah, basically like how does editing proceed and how do you kind of like obtain that, like uh, that like leanness or concision or whatever it is? Yeah, that is, it's definitely very true of it. That is such, it's such a, a long process of shooting these films and in the goal of it, uh, you know, coming off as, you know, very brief and um, quick. And uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting process trying to reduce it, but it's something I really love. I love the, the feeling of, of doing so many takes for a brief moment. That to me is a lot of the appeal of, of cinema, or at least how my brain works with cinema. So I love the feeling of, of also of, of cutting out scenes that I thought were important and realizing that it, it, the film works better without them. Um, so yeah, my collaboration with Isla, Isla's cut all of my films. Uh, we, we went to film school together. So we've been working together since 2007. Um, so I, yeah, it's, yeah, she has, I, I trust her a lot and her insight and her instincts and, um, her take on, on every sort of frame or, or, or moment. I hand a lot of it off to her. And, but with this film in particular, we, we experimented a lot, especially with the opening and the, uh, the intercutting uh, between the plane and uh, the classroom and some of those events. That, that wasn't in the, the screenplay. That's definitely something we discovered in the editing room. And that was almost, you know, as we're screening it for people, as we're doing test screenings, we're sort of slowly realizing how the film was opening and how it didn't feel right and making an adjustment or sort of really helping uh, start the film off the way that we wanted it to. Um, so yeah, editing in particular on this film. And I, I suppose another way of talking about editing too is that, you know, there's this sort of final process of reducing it and reducing it and getting it to the finished film, but we're also cutting and assembling the film as we shoot. Um, so over those two years, uh, we're, we're in between shoots, I'm assembling the footage and looking at it. So the editing is strangely also informing how the film is being shot or what's working in the editing room is kind of steering me slightly on set as well. Hmm. Well, um, I think we're gonna, we're gonna leave it there. Uh, but because I want to thank you uh, very much for, for bearing with us and, and, and joining us. Uh, and yeah, I hope to Hope to hang out with you uh, in person in New York or Toronto or someplace when people can hang out in person again. So um, yeah, no, I look forward to to that too. Uh, to yeah. When there will be cinemas again. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Until until then, uh, until then, we'll always have Anne at thirteen thousand feet. So thanks yeah. again. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Yeah.